It's time for Johnny and the Professor. Common sense in senseless times. Freedom means free speech, not politically correct safe spaces. Freedom means religious freedom, whether you are Christian or Jew, Muslim or atheist. Whether you are gay or straight, the Bill of Rights protects the rights of all of us to live according to our conscience. Freedom means the right to keep and bear arms and to protect your family. And freedom means recognizing that our Constitution allows states to choose policies that reflect local values. Colorado might decide something different than Texas. New York different than Iowa. That's the way it's supposed to be. Diversity. If not, what's the point of having states to begin with? Now, Hillary Clinton believes that government should make virtually every choice in your life. Education, health care, marriage, speech, all dictated out of Washington. What you want to do is destroy this guy's life, hold this seat open, and hope you win in 2020. You said that, not me. This is the most unethical sham since I've been in politics. And if you really wanted to know the truth, you sure as hell wouldn't have done what you've done to this guy. Boy, y'all want power. God, I hope you never get it. I hope the American people can see through this sham, that you knew about it and you held it. You're looking for a fair process. You came to the wrong town at the wrong time, my friend. If you believe that caring for the poor is primarily the responsibility of the church and of individuals rather than bureaucrats, you are out of today's left. Johnny and the Professor. Well, it's Johnny and the Professor. Common sense for senseless times. Where we talk politics, pop culture, and pajamas. Pajamas? Yeah, pajamas. The the uh, standard wear of people in the uh, most safe way in Aberdeen around right. in the afternoon. You go to Walmart in the afternoon, people are in their pajamas. I just, I'd have never understood that. I know they're comfy, but it's just, there's some personal cringiness for me. I don't know. Right. What. I agree. I kind of figure if you want to go out, you should, uh, you know, still be comfortable, but still wear the clothes that you don't wear to bed. But, but maybe we're just fuddy duddies and old fashioned. <laughs> right. Um, can't really find many of the onesies for adults with the footies. I'm sure you can, but they're probably they're a hard to find. Order. Yeah. I imagine you have to go, you know, look for the kind of places that also sell leather items and things like that, and animal costumes. And now, my six-year-old daughter, she doesn't seem to have a problem finding onesie PJs with the footsies in them, and it kind of bothers me because you know I'd like to wear some too. I get the onesies. But just not with the feeties in them, the footies, the little, you know what I mean? You know what yeah, I'm talking I mean, about? This is um, this falls into the too much information category for me, but that's all right. Okay, we'll, moving on. We'll just, uh, we'll just so, move on. Uh, we have a guest sometime today. Today we're going to have as our um, guest is going to be Victor Davis Hansen. And uh, Victor Davis Hansen, he's a professor emeritus from California State University, Fresno, which is my old alma mater. Oh, so you guys went to the same school? No, I actually, I took classes from him. Oh. Yeah, we, our, our uh, ages start with the same digit in front, but, there, but his are sli- he has slightly more than mine do. So this is your old, like, teacher? He's one of my old professors. I had him for a uh, Humanities of the Ancient World, and we studied the Peloponnesian War. He had wrote a book called The Western Way of War, which was a text that we used for this. And, of course, it was the uh, Persian War with the Athenians. It's ancient world stuff that a lot of people in the day would go snore. No, it's fascinating <laughs> stuff. So you have to, like, buy his book in order to, like, be in the class? Well, it was a book that he had that he wrote on it, which I still have it. It's a good source book. Yeah. Um, Professor Hansen's written uh, about ten different books, and I've read about I've read several of the ones that he has. I mean, he's a he's a commentator on um, uh, most on Fox News. Oh, he, Fox News. He was blah, in, blah. But he, I mean, for both Tucker Carlson, I think, and for uh, Laura Ingram. He also shows up on other broadcasts, and he also writes columns for the Washington Times and for the National Review, and he is a uh, fellow of the uh, of Stanford University's Hoover Institute, one of the senior fellows there on classics and military history. President Bush gave him the uh, National Humanities Award in 2007, and he's also sat on the presidential um, 
uh, as a presidential appointee on the uh, American Battle Monuments Commission around the same time. So he's a man of some credentials. I'm actually looking forward to talking to him again. I'm hoping that he remembers me, but on the other hand, he's had thousands of students. I was going to ask you, you think he'll remember you? I don't know. I mean, I have students I remember. They, yeah. And I've had, taught thousands of students also. So, I mean, it, it, there may be some that, that stick out. The main thing he'll probably remember of me is I turned in a small writing assignment to him that was only like a five-page paper on one of those. We did a many of those in the course of the, sem, of the semester. Mm-hmm. But I, my fourth sheet on the page was upside down. <laughs> it didn't get marked down for it, though I did get nice red co- comments on it about you need to check your papers before you turn them in type of thing. Right. And uh, so that's the kind of thing you, he might just remember. <laughs> And I got an A in his class. Those are generally the small percentages. That was my next question. Did yeah. you pass his class? Oh, yeah. I passed his class, got an A in it. And, and I don't, it wasn't that, you know, he, it wasn't a, you couldn't get an A in his class, but he made you work for it. Mm. I've had instructors that I've cruised through good grades on. He wasn't one of them. Okay. He wasn't the hardest I had. There was some, there's a one particular one at, at uh, Fresno State that, I mean, I was, I was one of, I think I was the only A in his entire class. Wow. And I came in at the, at like 90 exactly, hmm. not at, you know, just the very basis of, a, you know, of getting an A. And because uh, he was hard, well, he had hard tests. I don't want to say who it is because. <laughs> I don't and was that history also? It was, it was, a, it was an advanced history class. And well, our, uh, our, we did a, we did um, 2,000 pages of write, uh, 2,000 pages, 2,000 words of writing for the class in addition to, ex- in addition to five exams. Each exam had at least four or five pages of written essay about, um, had a multiple choice and fill-ins. Our exams took a full two hours each one to do. So it was a hard class. And I, I got an A and that was the one, okay? I didn't, no argument there. You had to, I had to fight tooth and nail for that one. But anyway, it'll be interesting to talk to um, Professor Hansen today. Um, I, and, and one of the things I'm, I'd be interested to talk about is what's in the news right now, is that um, what's happening with the uh, president has pulled American forces back in Syria and having to do with the Kurds. And I'd like to get his opinions on that because it's a very complicated issue. I think Trump has made a mistake here. The president has made a mistake. Yeah. I'm not sure that it was a good idea to do that because Turkey's already starting to be aggressive and he has he has he's put some forces in motion to try to deter them but it's a very complicated issue the kurds are an interesting thing because they're a group of people that live in the caucasus mountains and there are like 40 million of them 25 to 40 there's no accurate measurement of them but their territory is armenia is part of armenia part of iran part of iraq part of turkey part of syria i mean they're an indigenous people that lived in that area but when after World War I, the borders of the modern Middle Eastern were, were drawn up after, after uh, World War I, and they didn't end up with a country. So their territory is in multiple areas. And because of that, they don't exactly fit into the governments of areas. They want, they want to have their personal liberty and autonomy, which is, a, which is a noble thing, but they find themselves, say, for example, in Turkey, they have what's called the uh, Kurdistan Workers' Party, which, interesting because you translate it's PP. PKK, and they actually are considered by Turkey to be something of a terrorist organization because they have actually bombed areas of Turkey and done assaults on it. So, I mean, you know, and they're, and they're considered to be friendly with what's considered the SDF, which is the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are the forces in Syria that helped us against ISIS. They're kind of an ally of ours, but they're allied with someone who's considered a terrorist group by Turkey. And Turkey tends to put them in that same category. And in the, I mean, in, it, it's just, so, I mean, it's, it's a strange situation. You go, well, we should probably support them because they have been allies of ours in the past. We don't want to see them get, you know, ran over and wiped out and bombed out by Turkey. But on the other hand, Turkey's a, if we had a group in the United States that was actually bombing and blowing things up and trying to get, you know, if, if Arizona decided it wanted to leave the Union and started bombing areas as a way of getting away, wouldn't we treat the organizations in Arizona as a terrorist group then? if they weren't in, in the common support of the people. I mean, it's just, it's a complicated issue, which is why I'd like to talk to him about it. But I, my initial feeling on it is that since they have been our allies, we owe them something. But again, do we owe them, do we owe having them be a Vietnam and let's just spend thousands of lives, thousands and thousands of life there trying to fight a war between people that have been fighting it since, I mean, this has been a problem since World War One. So it's just, it's, it'll be an interesting issue to talk about. That's one of the big ones. And, and, and the most interesting thing about it, of course, is all the people coming out and screaming 
on the left, particularly about how horrible President Trump being to abandon the Kurds, who didn't give a monkey's butt about the Kurds before Trump decided to do this. Right. I mean, I, I swear, you know, all Donald Trump has to do is say, I'm against people taking, um, I want people to get lots of money from their, for their campaigns, and the Democrats will come out and say, well, we don't want any money for our campaigns. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's anything he says, the, they immediately do the opposite. It's like weird opposite world. <laughs> Bizarro world. Bizarro world. So that was, that was one of the things I thought was interesting for the day today. The other matter, of course, has to do with the whole, uh, they're still pushing for impeachment. We talked a little about this in the last show. But what, what is interesting is the White House actually submitted a letter to uh, the Speaker of the House, a very well-written legal document saying, your inquiry is, is constitutionally invalid and violates the basic process of rights and separation of powers. In other words, if you want to conduct a full-fledged investigation for impeachment, then take a vote for impeachment in the House, which is what you should do. Every time in the past, we remember, we've only had two actual impeachments in the past. There was a vote for impeachment, well, three technically. I mean, we have Andrew Johnson right after, after the Civil War. Then we have Richard Nixon, which was a vote, but it didn't get any further than that because Nixon resigned. And then, of course, the during Bill Clinton's time, the House voted for impeachment, and he was actually gone through the impeachment process. He shouldn't have. Though those were both, that was a political attack on Clinton, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't have been done. Nixon was involved in a crime directly because of Watergate, because of the conspiracy he did. I've always thought that's a strange one. If Richard Nixon had just simply apologized to the American people and process, prosecuted the people who were involved in the Watergate break-in, he'd have probably finished his term. And Andrew Johnson's was the same thing. He had he Johnson was of course Nixon was Nixon. Excuse me, was the exact opposite. Lincoln's vice president. Lincoln, of course, was assassinated. Johnson was a Democrat. Interesting. Lincoln was a Republican. He took a Democrat to help bring together the South as part of the uh, for the uh, Civil War. Now you can't have an opposite. You could. Uh, you can choose as your your candidate anybody you want. Oh, you can. You can, but okay. it, it, it would be argue, It would be arguable whether or not the party would would want to agree to it. Back then, yeah, the the Republican Party had just come into existence. I mean, it did. Remember, it came into it in the mid 18 1850s. The first presidential Republican candidate was Abraham Lincoln. He is, he is in, so in essence, he got his first term, he got his second term, and then was assassinated. So who was going to argue with him? I mean, he was father... Abraham. Assassinated by a Democrat. He, well, of course, John Wilkes Booth, who was a, who was more, he was a Democrat. He was also a, a secessionist. He was a big, you know, pro-South guy. He was, you know, that it was just a horrible tragedy. But it put Johnson in a bad position because he really didn't have the, he wasn't actually Republican. It was the Republicans after him then, too. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. The Democrats brought it up, uh, impeachment against Nixon. The Republicans brought it against Johnson and against Clinton. And now, in this one, if we do it now, it'll be the Democrats coming around again. But I can, I definitely think the argument from a historical point point of view. You know, if you want to investigate, then by all means investigate, but you need to have a vote on the floor that says we are starting an impeachment process. They, and I, they don't want to do it for a simple reason. It's an election year coming up, and anybody who votes for that in those districts where st states where Trump won the states and they're Democrats in those, in those districts, they don't want to be on record for going up an impeachment. Why? Because when Bill Clinton was impeached, his popularity went up 10 or 15 points. I'm exaggerating, but he went up almost 10 points. Yeah. It was because there's a sympathy vote on it. People realized that Clinton was a horn dog, but he didn't do anything that was a threat to the United States. Well, everything Trump does is a threat to the United States, according, apparently. According to, the, according to the Democrats. See, but again, this letter that the, that the, uh, the, uh, pr the White House put in, a second part of it states that, that the invalid impeachment inquiry plainly seeks to reverse the election of 2016 and to influence the election of 2020. They're trying to undermine Trump as their argument. They're trying to say the last election was invalid, which is this whole thing. Bill, as far as I can tell, the only real crime that Donald Trump is guilty of is beating Hillary Clinton. And, of course, the third part is there is no legitimate basis for the inquiry. What about the Ukraine thing? They've been moving for impeachment of Donald Trump since he, before he was inaugurated. Well, yeah, any moron can see that. And so, I mean, this has anything to do with it. And, again, we've talked about that in here. I have, we, we brought out that, we, the transcript that had came from the White House released on that, which is unprecedented. They don't have to do that. Because if, if I'm the President of the United States and I'm having a conversation with, you know, with the, pre with the Prime Minister of, of Great Britain, 
that information has to be considered confidential. Right. Because right. you may talk about things that are top secret. And if you're just going to leak that information out, and that's what's happened. The first thing happened, remember, Trump first took office in one of his first conversations with the Australian prime minister, and it was leaked all over the all over the media. I mean, it, that's, that's a crime. Now, who's doing that leaking? Again, leftovers from the Obama administration, mm -hmm. leftovers from the Bush administration. See, that's, that's one of the things we can also talk to um, Professor Hansen about today is that both both sides, to some extent, are oppo in opposition to Donald Trump because he is a unique individual. He was a businessman. He is actually coming in to try to deal with the this the swamp is what we use the term. I my term for they went to my kind of tickled my fancy, but I thought of it, he's a he's killer croc Trump. He jumps into the swamp and wrestles with the alligators. You know the these you know which again are the which is the CIA, the FBI had people in that. The high end of that have been these perpetual uh, these perpetual unelected individuals that are part of our government. In addition to the members of the House and the Senate that are just trying to keep their power and money in place and not have to actually fix and deal with the real problems. See, and what I don't get is we've been wanting someone like this who's not attached to special interests or to lobbyists or bought and paid for, or not a member of career politicians club, and then we get one, and then we still complain. I think it depends on the people in power are obviously complaining because, again, Trump saw an opening there by basically defending the working people of America and against the elites the coastal elites and the Washington elites. I mean, that's how he got elected. Mm -hmm. People are thinking, I'm not, this is a, well, you're just praising Trump. No, I'm just simply evaluating history here. He went in there, he had, he had good instincts, and he had energy, and he went after victory. He knocked out 16 other mostly well-qualified candidates and, and came up on top. We're looking at a situation where we're, this it, the presidency is very volatile, but on the other hand, the country's kind of just been a drifting a drifting along with this kind of, uh, the, the government's just doing it. They're just, it's, it got to the point, it's hard to tell the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. All they do is just sit in there and make noise and do nothing. When we Again, we've had border problems for 30 years in this country. We have Republicans and Democrats in there, and what have they done to deal with the, the issues of illegal immigration? And the answer is nothing. Trump comes along and says, I want to fix it. I want to deal with the deep state problem. People who aren't elected shouldn't be determining. They shouldn't be off trying to undermine a presidency. And they, but yet they had to. I mean, it, it, because, again, other powers are just letting it go along. The, the Obama administration had its problems, and it, it's one of the reasons we have this, these issues today, because they, were, they used government agencies to attack political opponents, like the IRS going against uh, conservative charities. But Bush did it, too, and Clinton did it, too. We're just moving along into a... We've been we've been moving in this kind of drifting along lackadaisical mentality that says, oh, well, everything's just politics. And what do we have to do? And, right. and suddenly and yet we want to see change. And along comes Donald Trump. And he he jumped in there and he, he carpe diem. He seized the day and he got people to back him. And because of that, the neocons, which means the very conservative Republican types and the lefties both hating. Aren't the Democrats trying to make the country socialist so now you take money from the rich people and give it to the people who aren't rich it's all a matter of maintaining their power base i would agree so i do agree with that i mean that's the whole idea but they're they're leaning socialism is the idea of course the big big enough government to control your people and to keep your people in line it's it's funny because it's the opposite of the rugged individualism that america was founded on the idea that people have independent rights you know, you, they're, they're requiring you to surrender yourself to the government. You're having to, and they're doing it by giving you stuff. They'll give you what you, they'll give you that you won't have to work, you won't have to, everyone will get a basic income. And everyone will get an, an equal opportunity to be miserable is what socialism makes. And people say, well, what about the Scandinavian countries? There's all these countries that are socialist. And that's a, and that's a, that's a load of crap. If you uh, talk to the people who run those countries and say, do you consider it a socialist? Most of the countries you're talking about in North European, like Norway, Norway has a higher tax rate than we do, but it also is much more expensive to live there. And didn't one of the leaders of one of those quote-unquote socialist countries come out and say... It was, Excuse it was me. Sweden said the the it was the prime minister, president of Sweden was. We're not socialists. We're not socialists. We are. They have oil exports. They have. They they are very much capitalism because capitalism is the only way you can pay for for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason we, you can afford to be socialist if you can make enough money. You somewhat socialist if you can if you make enough money in your capitalism. 
That's why China's doing cap, China's adapted capitalistic ideas, even though it's, it is an actual communist government. But it's using the capitalist ideas so it can make enough money to fund and keep its people enslaved. Give them their little measures of happiness or measures of suffering, depending on how you want to look at it. Again, I, China's, you know, I wouldn't want to be, the, I'm not, I don't want to be a co the common man in China because you live a horrible life. It's worse, you could be in North Korea. Or Venezuela, right? Or Venezuela, yeah. But those, of course, are, you know, Bernie Sanders was, not, was a few years ago, was telling us how wonderful Venezuela was. So, and it tells you something about his viability as a candidate. And there, and again, with Biden wounded because of the situation with the Ukraine, with Liz Warren, you know, again, being caught in another. She, okay, no, she's not a Native American. Oh, she didn't get fired because she was pregnant. Uh, she's trying to play the victim cards because she's just totally, you know, white bread, librarian looking individual mm -hmm. that no, that's as exciting as as plaster drying <laughs> and then you got or you have cur crazy bernie sanders who doesn't like millionaires of course he is one so now it has to be billionaires right so anyway it's johnny and the professor and coming up our interview with victor davis hansen joining me now victor davis hansen what do you make of that notion we've had a rich array of issues voiced on the democratic primary platform and debates and why don't house members say you know what i'm introducing a bill for reparations new green deal i want to get legislation passed uh, giving medicare for everybody or health care for illegal aliens we don't see that instead we're into about the 10th iteration now we had the voting machines uh lawsuit 25th amendment Logan Act, Emoluments Clause, Mueller. Remember, uh, we even had psychiatrists declaring Trump unfit. So in that sense, this is just another version of an effort to delegitimize the president. It wasn't just Hillary Clinton that said irredeemables and deplorables of the Trump voter. There was Joe Biden said that they were the dregs of society. I think uh, Peter Strzok was caught in a text message just saying basically they were smelly. We had a CNN people say that Trump at Trump rallies, people had no teeth. You saw that Jesse Smollett, when he he had that hoax. He deliberately made the villains people with Trump hats. Same was true of the Covington kids. They were demonized because they had these red hats. So you put it all together and it's an effort to say this person had no political or military experience. He should not have won. He was out fundraised. Uh, all the experts said he didn't have a chance. It couldn't happen and it did and it's illegitimate. We're not going to stand for it. I think, Martha, the only mystery is what's the end game with the impeachment? Is it just a primal scream to get this emotion out or is it just to have an end inquiry and create enough chaos and smears and leaks that maybe you can drive his polls down like we've already seen in the Rasmussen poll today? Or is it to actually have a vote, impeach him, and then have an asterisk behind his name for the 2020 election? Or maybe it, they believe that they can flip three or four senators in the Senate. And while that's not enough constitutionally to result in a conviction and removal from office, the Democrats can say, well, we had a majority vote to impeach him, and we had a majority vote vote in the Senate if we flip three or four uh, Republican senators, except for that stupid old constitution, we would have removed him. It's like the Electoral yeah. College. They stopped us. Or finally, in a more macabre fashion, Martha, it, this is kind of scary. I think that they're trying to wear down the physical and mental resilience of Donald Trump. We saw what happened to Bernie on the campaign trail. It's not an easy thing for a septuagenarian to run or be in office. And we know what happened to Richard Nixon during that ordeal. He got phlebitis, pneumonia, and almost died. And I think people think, you know, at some point, the legendary Trump physicality is going to crack. And each one of these assaults, whether it's Mueller or 25th Amendment or whistleblower, it's like an invisible little crack in an eggshell. And at some point, maybe this whistleblower or Ukraine business, the final tap will just implode everything yeah. and he will be gone and we won't have to worry about him anymore. But <laughs> they all have one thing in common. They don't believe in a constitutional referendum in 2020 as the Constitution states to yeah. have an upper dawn vote on their president to see if he should be reelected. Yeah. You're listening to Johnny and the Professor. Politics. This is actually what makes this whole thing so comical. Pop culture. This is something that they're going to be prioritizing in that is diversity. Now this is stupid. Common sense in senseless times. This is Johnny and the Professor. Common sense in senseless times. 
politics. It's the furthest extension of political correctness. And when you say something, that it's not just me that's agreeing with you, it is me destroying your identity as a human being in a way that is akin to violence. Pop culture. For the crimes that you have committed, for the crimes against Luke Skywalker, for the crimes against Han Solo, for the crimes against uh, Princess Leia, for the crimes against George Lucas. This is Johnny and the Professor. Contact the show at jpshowfm at gmail.com. Well, it's Johnny and the Professor, and on the phone with us today, Victor Davis Hanson, military historian, columnist, farmer, commentator on modern and ancient warfare and contemporary politics for National Review, The Washington Times, and other media outlets. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you. I'd like to talk to you about the uh, current situation with uh, the uh, United States pulling forces out of uh, Syria. What do you think about that? Well, I generally have opposed doing that for a variety of reasons. One is that we've had a historic, it's been remarked about, a historic relationship with the Kurds, and they're sort of like the Armenians or the Israelis or the Poles or the Greeks. They've more or less been pro-American, and they're in a difficult geography. They've got a lot of enemies, and we've usually tried to be helpful to them, and in, in recent history, they've been very good um, as far as allying us with us against Baathists in Iraq or ISIS. I understand the paradox of what the situation we're in. That is that Turkey is a legal ally, but it's not a friend. The Kurds are friends, but they're not legal allies. So a lot of the critics of Trump who say you got to be tough and, and oppose Turkey are the same ones who say you you're too hard on NATO, and that's mutually inconsistent. That is definitely the, other, the case, since Turkey is a NATO ally, after all. Yeah. And then the other paradox is we say Kurds, but there's Kurds in Iraq, there's Kurds in Iran, there's Kurds in Syria, and there's Kurds in Turkey. Armenia, too. Armenia. And most of them are pro-American and wonderful people, but there are terrorists in Syria, there's terrorists in Turkey, there's even terrorists in Iran. So it makes it hard sometimes to say we're for the Kurds, and then our critics say, well, they're blowing up people in a shopping center in Turkey, or they're attacking the theocratic government by shooting a policeman in Iran. So it's a little bit more complicated than we think. And then the third problem is Trump was elected by winning blue states such as Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and recently Florida and North Carolina. And most people believe it was because he got three to four million Reagan Democrats, parole voters, Tea Party, whatever we call them, to come out to vote, who either voted for Obama or did not vote in 2008 and 2012. And one of the pillars of that appeal to them, besides secure borders and cracking down on China and bringing back manufacturing, was we were not going to get into overseas engagements that were not in a cost-benefit analysis favorable to the U.S., such as Iraq or Afghanistan, but especially Libya, to a certain degree, Syria. And so Trump is kind of captive to that campaign promise, and I think he's going to have what it all boils down to is he's going to have to recalibrate and help the Kurds, but he's going to have to do so in a way that doesn't get into a war with a NATO ally and doesn't violate his campaign promises of getting mired in a Mideast quagmire and realizes that there's Kurds and there's Kurds, and he's got to be, and that's going to take a lot of effort by Secretary Pompeo. Do you think he'll have any uh, success by putting economic pressures on Turkey as he has uh, threatened yeah, to Yeah, I think he will. I think he will. He's getting credit, criticism from both sides of the aisle, but the critics are not being intellectually honest. They're not saying these are the same critics who told us that Turkey was an essential NATO ally. And I think the larger question that transcends the Kurds is it's the only Muslim NATO country and it's increasingly anti-Israel, anti-Greek, um, and anti-American. And we've got to decide whether it should belong in NATO or not. It's a very helpful NATO ally in terms of geography, but anybody who's been there recently can see that it's not the same country as it was 20 years ago. Uh, on the one hand, when you go, I've gone to, been embedded twice during the Iraq War. When you go to Kurdistan, it's a modern oasis. 
it looks parts of it look like you know san jose or des moines iowa it's got shopping centers and people are dressing like westerners and there's freedom but there's also rivalries there's authoritarianism and there's also elements of kurds in the mountains of iraq that are going across the border and killing people for political economy and so we have to be careful we should the kurds that are fighting isis and are not allied with assad and hezbollah are good people and they're doing a lot of good for us and we've got to support them find a way that to protect them so they're not slaughtered by turkish and maybe even russian air power but i think that can be done with the existing resources uh in a way that doesn't violate the idea that he's getting this into a a Middle East mess. I'm afraid that if we pull out entirely, there'll be some carnage and slaughter, and then we'll have to go back in the way that Obama got us out of Iraq. ISIS came in, and then Trump, who said he didn't want to go in, to, to, was forced to use force to get rid of ISIS. So we, the long-term goal is the least amount of American forces in the long run. And I think that means don't pull out objectively right now. Well, we haven't actually pulled out, if memory serves me. They've shifted the no, troops we southern. That's a good point. It's, so, I mean, it is not that they're real. gone. Yes, we're just real, a lot. We're rearranging and redeploying people within the country, and we're trying to say that we're going to pull them off the likely uh, engagement zone between Turkish forces and Kurdish forces. We're just pulling them out of harm's way, so to speak. But the actual numbers haven't decreased yet. And the Kurds are saying if you don't get in between us and Turkey, they're going to kill us all. Well, if you don't supply 100% air cover, they're going to kill us all. And which unfortunately saying, has actually started, though, because Erdogan has actually started bombing. Yes, and we're saying this is a historical grievance between you and Turkey. And we're not, we appreciate your past service, but we're not going to get in the middle of another war. And that's where the definitions and everything start to get murky. Not an easy, not an easy problem to solve. Of course, that pretty much defines the Middle East in general, I would tend to think. Yeah, I don't think anybody has an answer. You know, it would have been it would have been nice if after World War One everyone had actually looked over the geography before drawing the borders up and found out who lived where and what kind of peoples. Yeah, it would have been nice in 1975 is when he got out of Vietnam and Kissinger had it said, you know, Iran hates uh, our ally, the Shah hates Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and they both hate the Kurds. So so we can have some kind of anti-communist solidarity, we're going to allow both of them to sell out the curve, and then they'll be both anti com It was a bad idea, I think. It'd been better to, to support some type of Kurdish autonomy then. Now it seems like we're supposed to love communists and communism. Yeah, I think so. Well, we're supposed to. The left is basically saying that it has human rights ideals that are going to govern foreign policy, except when it goes to Trump, then Trump should. Whatever Trump is for, the left is against. <laughs> I've heard that before. We were talking yeah. about that earlier, actually. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, if you keep that in mind, then it, there's a consistency. The left is is so unusually strange, but then again, the neocons are almost the same way. It's it's one of the things I noted when I, I read your book, um, The Case for Trump, that he, he seems uniquely positioned to actually really piss off the left and the right to, because he's trying to resolve the issue of this whole swampish, shadowy government we seem to have that's just kind of slogging along. Yeah, I think the one constant in all of the hysteria that surround Trump, whether it was the voting machines, allegations, 25th Amendment, Logan Act, Mollimus Clause, the psychodrama of McCabe and Rosenstein's coup, uh, the Mueller investigation, Stormy tax return, now the whistleblowers, is that there's a huge number of people at the head of intelligence agencies, the IRS, the DOJ, that are permanent employees. And they tend to be left of center because they're always for bigger government, higher taxes, and better pensions. And they can't be fired, so they have very unrealistic views of the world. And when a Republican comes into power, they tend to be a little bit suspicious more than they are Democrats. But when a guy like Trump comes in, and Bragg's is going to drain them, then they take matters into their own hands. So they leak his presidential calls. They brag to the New York Times in an editorial that they're passively resisting everything he does. They militarize the court so that uh, they can sue and block his legislation. And they memorialize private 
uh, conversations with them and leaked them to the press the way Comey did. And so they're everywhere. They're in the deal, or they failed to carry out or, orders in the way Sally Yates did. So they're everywhere. And to even say that becomes makes you a conspiracy theorist. So I think that's his biggest problem, that he has no natural constituency, that when a Republican president comes in like his Democratic counterpart, he relies on his team to protect him. And what that would mean is there should be a Republican bipartisan establishment, sort of the old wise men of Washington, a Colin Powell or George Shultz or somebody like that, who would step up and support a Republican. They're either neutral about them or opposed to them. There should be unanimity among uh, the Republican conservative press. But if you turn into Shep Smith or Judge Napolitano or even some like people on Red Bar, Fox can be very critical. If you, you, the Weekly Standard people have the bulwark, very critical. Now there's going to be the dispatch from Jonah Goldberg and others. 10% of the Republicans never vote for the Republican nominee, but this time they're actively in influential positions trying to destroy him. And that's new. We haven't seen that. It's also very interesting, considering the fact that when they poll on Republicans on approval ratings of Trump alone, he comes out extremely high. The people, the Republican voters, seem to be like what he's doing. It just seems to be, that, again, it's the power brokers. It's the ones that are just trying to keep their high pensions and their cushy jobs. They're the ones that seem to be the most opposed to it. Yeah. Well, in terms of Republican support, if you go, and I have, look at the percentages of Republicans that voted for George W. Bush and uh, John McCain and Mitt Romney, it's about the same as Trump. So for all of the loud criticism of the Never Trumpers, they had zero effect on the Republican Party, and I think they understand that. What they're aiming at is the key 15 to 20 percent of non-aligned voters, and they see their mission as to convince the soccer mom, the independent suburban family, the socially conservative, uh, the economically conservative, socially liberal voter that Trump is beyond the pale and you can't vote for him. And their ultimate logic is hard to fathom, but it's something like the Republican Party has to pay penance for nominating him and getting him elected. And even though 95% of his agenda is what these people have supported, it's been compromised or tainted by his fingerprints on them. And so we have to destroy Trump and destroy the Republican Party as we know it. And then out of the ashes, sober and judicious people like Bill Crystal or George Will will come forward and save us and create another George H.W. Bush, uh, Mitt Romney type of party which, by the way, had not won 51% of the vote since 1988. I know. it's they're not. You're not shooting for a high mark if you're going to go back to that. I'm not fond. You know, Romney was a horrible candidate, I thought, personally. Yeah. Well, they wanted to lose nobly whether to, rather than to win ugly. And Trump came along and said, I'm going to win ugly if that's what it takes. And if they attack me, I'm going to hit back twice as hard. And I don't mind using the same tactics as they do. I don't care what they say about me and my, or my family. I'm just going to go on the attack 24-7, 360 degrees. And like the proverbial gunslinger, everybody said, wow, this, this is great. And then when he started to have a fact and then the left kind of backed off and he got his agenda through, then people said, well, did we really have to do that? And so that's his dilemma. That He's using the very techniques that are necessary to get rid of a lot of his progressive influence, but the people who put him up to it, the more successful he becomes, the more margin of error they feel they have, and they can distance himself from the means which he employs. What do you think about um, President Trump and his tweeting? I mean, I, my opinion briefly would be he confuses me lots of times when I read them, and then sometimes afterwards I go, Maybe he's just crazy like a fox, because it seems like he knows exactly what he's wanting to do. But yet it seems to be also, it's a massive distraction, but it's generally a distraction when he wants to do something else. Everybody says, meaning conventional wisdom says, I wish he would just tweet about his positives and not get into cul-de-sac fights or feuds with George Conway or Rosie O'Donnell or some minor washed-up figure. 
But that being said, the Shorenstein Center said 91% of all media coverage was negative of Trump. He's got 60 million Twitter followers, so that's the only way he can connect and get his view out. He has a certain Fox-like cunning, and by that I mean he believes that he is, if he gets into the wrestling ring and gets muddy, it doesn't hurt him as much as sanctimonious, self-righteous people that say they would never get dirty and who are dirty. So in his way of thinking, I'm going to call them the names. That I'm going to be as tough on them as they as they are on me. I'm going to draw out the real the real person beneath the veneer. I'm going to make Elizabeth Warren, who's been lying in elegant tones, I'm going to make her take a DNA test. I'm just going to keep <laughs> saying crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary, till she melts down and shows us that she is crooked. So I'm going to mention China, 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 Ukraine, 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 Biden, 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 Biden. And they're going to get so furious and say they're going to impeach me. I shouldn't do that. But in the process, they're going to mention Biden. And they would never mention him without that. And then they're going to say Donald Trump should be impeached for mentioning China. And by the way, Joe Biden is absolutely innocent of it. And then in the process of saying that, the word gets out that he's really involved. That's Trump's strategy with Twitter. It's to to get mention of a topic that he wants, even though in theory it hurts him as much or more than the subject of his of his attack. But in the long run, nobody can decide whether it's diminished his presidential profile or it's the only desperate means he has to keep alive. It was good arguments on both sides. Did you read over the uh, White House letter to uh, Speaker Pelosi dealing with the issue I of did. impeachment? I thought it was really well crafted. I did too. I've, uh, I thought it was um, it, obviously the legal team. It's it's probably something that's going to actually be showing up in law schools in the future because I thought it was extremely well crafted. The whole point of it is that if you want, I mean, I by distilling it down, we talked about it a little before we. Uh, uh, brought you on here that if you're going to conduct an investigation of impeachment then you need to do you need to do a vote for impeachment on the floor of the house they're going to have to put it into an official investigation and i know the democrats don't want to do that especially those who were in states that trump won who are trying who are looking at the re-election the way to look at that is there's all these democrats from aoc to the leadership pelosi and schumer and those people they all have different agendas, but they're united on their hatred of Donald Trump. <laughs> and so it's nice to have, have a common enemy, I guess, but okay. <laughs> yes. They all have a strategy about impeachment. For some, like AOC, they don't care what the polls say, what the pundits say. It's just a primal scream. We got to get this out. We just have to impeach the SOB anyway. I don't care whether it's stupid or smart helps or hurts us, got to get it out. For others, it is, we don't want an impeachment vote because it'll hurt swing state Democrats that were elected in 2018. But if we outsource it to the judici- uh, from the judiciary and the incompetent J- Jerry Nadler to the incompetent Adam Schiff intelligence, then we don't have to release stuff. We can say it's national security or redacted. So we can leak, leak, leak and say that this testimony was damning or this email was damning and not release it. And then sort of just bleed Trump for three or four months with a thousand nick. For others, it's we want to impeach him and we feel that whatever downside that will have will be have an upside that he'll be forever a president with an asterisk in, on his name that he was impeached just like bill clinton some of them feel you know what mitt romney is weakening susan collins has said some ambiguous things so is lisa murkowski ben sass has criticized trump they only have 52 republican senators what if we just have the impeachment and then bring, make it a circus you know bring in a susan blasey ford type witness or another michael avenetti type person and so drive down scare these republicans at four or five vote for us for conviction then we tell the american people on the eve of the election well a majority of your congress voted to impeach him and depose him that was what the house voted to do and a majority of senators and the senate voted to do the same thing now unfortunately we have this ossified constitution like the electoral college does it doesn't <laughs> represent popular will but there was popular will to have a trial and to convict him and therefore he's illegitimate and then and finally, for the most extreme, I think the agenda is keep the guy up all night long, destroy his family, make fun of him. He's 73 years old. He's overweight. He doesn't get exercise. He's got terrible personal habits. 
We saw how Bernie melted down on the campaign trail with a heart attack. We know that in 74, Nixon crashed under the pressure and had phlebitis and pneumonia and almost died. And we can wreck this guy mentally and physically before the election's over. And I think all of those are agendas or, or aims that they have. I don't think any of them are going to work because they have no real evidence and they don't have a compelling case. And there's a lot of people who are going to expose that. But for now, I think short term, all of those strategies are, are reducing his uh, stature in the polls a little bit by three or four points. Which is interesting because he had actually had a rise recently, so the attack, it had to go the other direction. Because I'm not so sure, though, with Donald Trump, because he seems to really like the fight. I'm not sure that you're going to wear him down. I think the more you fight him, I think the more likely he's going to be wanting yeah, to fight I back. Think I've written that. But I'm not saying I agree with it. I just think that's your strategy. I think he's more of a Nietzschean, Frederick Nietzschean character where he believes anything that can kill him makes him stronger. Makes him stronger. Agreed. And he likes the idea that he has wounds and he's fought and he gets up in the morning and wants to. I think his he feels the most uh, invigorating and healthy moments of his life are those rallies, the adulation, the appeal, the arguments he makes. I think it's not going to bother him in the way it would it would have destroyed him. Obviously, that was something that terrified Mitt Romney. He never wanted to be in that situation. Um, to a lesser extent, George W. Bush was, by 2006, was wounded by it and felt that he was traumatized by the hatred. Even John McCain, who'd been a war hero, did not want to get in a fight with Barack Obama, mention Reverend Wright, do what it would be necessary to use the tactics that Obama used. He didn't want to do that. That's sort of where we have Trump now, because he's a reaction to these Marcus of Queensbury Republicans. And unfortunately, they're, they're, they fight Marcus of Queensbury, and that nobody's told the Republican Party that the Democrats are bringing knives to the fight. And we've been fighting... Well, they're very clever. They always, they always praise a Republican when he's out of office, so... Suddenly, Reagan is a wonderful guy when he's gone. He's no longer senile. He's no longer going to blow up the world. <laughs> and George H.W. Bush, who was greedy and uh, a spoiled frat boy, suddenly he was a sober and judicious senior statesman that made commercials with Bill Clinton. And then W., who they just hated as a Nazi and a fascist, now he appears with Ellen DeGeneres. He's critical of Trump. He's okay. People feel that... Why can't Trump just be a Bush? And uh, that's what they've done with McCain. McCain, they love McCain. As you saw at the funeral, even though they said he you know, had, couldn't remember that he had 11 houses. Or Mitt Romney is now a senior statesman to the left. He's a guy that they've said tortured dogs. And right. <laughs> I remember and that. Never talked to his garbage man. Didn't pay his taxes. So it's a pretty predictable script. I don't think, I think Trump's the one person that when he leaves office, they're not going to praise. <laughs> Even though he's done a lot more in the economy than they ever did. They will not, they will not come to praise Donald, but to yeah. bury him? Well, no, no, no. anyway. Well, Professor Hansen, it has been a privilege uh, to uh, talk with you. I've uh, I very much enjoyed it, and I hope that you'll uh, come and do it again with us sometime. Well, thank you. Well, that'll do it for this episode of Johnny and the Professor. If you want to uh, contact us or comment, uh, you can email jpshowfm at gmail.com. Or you can go on to YouTube and do a search for Johnny and the Professor. Put quotation marks around it. You'll find it right away that way, and we'll have all of our audios of all of our shows posted there and of course i have my own web channel which is arena of history on youtube you're listening to johnny and the professor politics this is actually what makes this whole thing so comical pop culture this is something that they're going to be prioritizing and that is diversity now this is stupid common sense in senseless times